Hello. Greetings, my friend. Welcome to the podcast, Teaching the Transforms with Pastor Jimmy Knott. Thank you so much for joining me today. Today, a conclude series I've been on. This is the seventh podcast. The series entitled, Gigantic Affirmations from Christ, the I Am Sayings of Jesus. All of these are recorded in the Gospel of John, whose sole uh, purpose in writing his book was to declare and to affirm the deity of Jesus Christ. These I am sayings all help us to understand the identity of Jesus and the mission of Jesus. Thus far, we've looked at I am the bread of life, I am the light of the world, I am the door or the gate, I am the good shepherd, I am the resurrection and the life, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And then this seventh and final gigantic affirmation in John chapter 15, I am the true vine. In this passage, Jesus really details the very essence of Christian living, and that is to abide, to remain, to to stay in touch, uh, to uh, live with, as it were, Christ, and then as a result of that vital relationship, to bear fruit. So to abide in Christ and to bear fruit. Again, these last two sayings are are different in terms of context and audience than the first five. The first five took place uh, in in, in public crowds. And uh, these last two, in chapters 13 to 17, Jesus is giving private instructions basically over one evening uh, to those closest to him, his disciples, for just a few hours before uh, uh, his death. Let me read the passage. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers. And the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples." As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. Then skipping down to verse 16, Jesus says, You did not choose me, but I chose you, and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit, and that your fruit should abide so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. He may give it to you. We need to identify and understand there are five uh, elements or or, or critical symbols uh, in this last I am saying that really helps us to uh, have a fuller meaning, as it were, to the entire passage. There is the vine, and that's a reference to Jesus. Jesus is the vine. There is the vine dresser. That's a reference to God or to God the Father. There are the branches. The branches are Christians. We'll deal with that more in a few minutes. There is the concept of abide. And there is the concept of fruit. I'll unpack those as we walk through this lesson today. But here's the principle. Abiding in the vine results in bearing fruit. It's simply simply just that. Abiding in Him, staying in Him results in our bearing fruit. Let's look at each of these elements for a few minutes. First, the vine is the sun. Back in the Old Testament, in a number of places, uh, Israel uh, uh, was symbolized with the vine. Isaiah chapter 5, uh, verses 1 to 7 is probably the best picture of that, but also in Psalm 80, verses 8 to 16. God had planted the Jewish people, the nation of Israel, into a foreign land, into the land of Canaan, and he did that for them to bear fruit. Unfortunately, for the most part, they came up empty. In the New Testament, 
This sign is personalized in the person of Jesus Christ. Jesus says twice, I am the true vine. Like Israel, he was planted, but he was much more than a symbol. The passage says he's the true vine. He's the actual vine. He is the, uh, the real vine. He is the genuine vine. Not a copy, not a substitute, but the real thing. And the vine, Jesus, is the source of life for the branch. He is the vine. Second picture is that of the vine dresser, who is the father. The vine dresser plants the vine as he did with the nation Israel and as he did with the person of his son Christ. Note the actions of, uh, of the uh, vine dresser that are mentioned here in the passage. The gardener does something to those branches not bearing fruit. It mentions in verse 2 and 6 that some of the branches are not bearing fruit. And for those that don't, he cuts off or takes away or removes them. I'll address that in a little bit more detail later. And then the gardener or the vine dresser also does something to those branches that are not bearing enough fruit. It says he prunes them or he cleanses them by pinching them or by topping it off or thinning it out like we do a lot of our foliage in our uh, gardens or in our yards uh, when we come into the uh, into the, the springtime. But the pruning describes a cleansing process, which frankly uh, may help, uh, uh, may hurt in order uh, to, uh, to help. Very important, very important. Uh, one uh, New Testament uh, writer, Merrill Tinney, said in pruning a vine, two principles are generally observed. First, all dead wood must be ruthlessly removed. And second, the live wood must be cut back drastically. Dead wood harbors insects and disease. It may cause the vine to rot, to say nothing of being unproductive and unsightly. Live wood must be trimmed back in order to prevent such heavy growth that the life of the vine goes into the, uh, to the wood rather than into fruit. The vineyards in the early spring look like a collection of barren, bleeding stumps. But in the fall, they are filled with luxurious uh, purple grapes. As the farmer wields the pruning knife on his vines, so God cuts dead wood out from among his saints and often cuts back the living wood so that far uh, that the, his method uh, seems cool. Nevertheless, for those who have suffered the most there often comes the greatest fruitfulness uh, in our lives. So Jesus is the vine the Heavenly Father is the vine dresser. He plants us and he, and he uh, cuts back uh, the branches and he prunes the branches. I think the instrument that he uses more than anything else, uh, his pruning instrument is the, is the Word of God. Sometimes he'll use difficult circumstances, but he knows how to get the knife and he knows how to use the knife uh, in our lives. The third picture here and symbol that's important is that the branches are Christians. This is a little bit tough passage, but I'm going to try to uh, make my way through it and give you understanding. There are two kinds of Christians or branches that are mentioned here. Both, please note this, both are in union with Christ. This passage is not about salvation. This passage is about the Christian life and producing fruit. The words in this passage from Jesus are aimed at those who have already established a relationship with him. The thrust here is not on becoming a Christian, but on bringing fruit or producing as a Christian. So there are two kinds of Christians. First are the fruitful and productive uh, branches, and a few truths about them. First is they abide in him. That's the secret to bearing fruit. Ten times in a passage, 11 if you count verse 16, he says to abide. It means to stay or to remain or to grow in union with or to draw strength from. It's a key term in the passage. He, as the vine, is the only source of true spiritual life. He says in verse 4, without him we can do not very little or we can do less than the best. Without him we can do nothing. He is that sap running from the vine of Christ into the branches is the person of the Holy Spirit at work in our lives when we come into a relationship with him. William Barclay explains it this way. The secret of the life of Jesus was his contact with God. Again and again, he withdrew into a solitary place to meet him. We must keep in contact with Jesus. We cannot do that unless we deliberately take the steps to do it. Take, to take but one example to pray in the morning. For most of us, it will mean a constant contact with him. It will mean arranging life, arranging prayer, arranging silence in such a way that there is never a day when we give ourselves a chance to forget 
him, to forget him. Notice in the passage that there are varying degrees of fruitfulness. And he really mentions four in the passage. There are those Christians who are bearing no fruit, those who are bearing fruit, those who are bearing more fruit, and those who are bearing much fruit. What's he talking about here? Well, I think he's telling us that there'll be different levels of fruit bearing in our lives at times. What, what, when he mentions fruit, what's he talking about? Well, I think primarily in the passage, because this passage, I think, connects to the life, the bread of life, uh, the resurrection and the life. And last time we talked about way of truth and the life, and that's life in him and becoming more like him. I think the fruit primarily here is a reference to, uh, uh, to Christ-likeness in attitudes and beliefs and behaviors. He is producing, he the vine, Jesus, is producing, reproducing his life through us. Uh, uh, and we yield to his uh, uh, influence in our lives. And the keys to that, keys to this fruit bearing, the keys to growing and developing more fruit is abiding and responding rightfully to the pruning process. Remember down in verse 16, he said, I have appointed you that you should go and you bear much fruit. We are chosen appointed to bear fruit and when we do he gives us some evidences or some benefits of being fruit bearing in our lives he says in verse 7 we experience answered prayer he says in verse 8 we bring glory to the father he says in verses 9 and 10 that our motivation is love our motivation for obeying him is love and then last which is one of my favorites in verse 11 he says, these things have I spoken to you that my joy may be in you and your joy may be full. And that's complete fullness of joy. Remember, remember, John 14 says they were so troubled. In two places they were so troubled. Well, there's no room for trouble and worry when joy reigns in our lives. So you have two kinds of branches or Christians, the fruitful and the productive ones. And then let me speak to the fruitless and the barren ones. First, he says that those who bear no fruit are cut off. It's a very interesting word. It's the word that we get our res uh, word resurrection from. It means to raise up or to lift up. Now, why is that important? Because great vines do not produce fruit if they are allowed to fall and to remain in the dirt. And neither will Christians. And that's why God has to lift us up. Uh, through uh, through discipline in our lives and lifting us up out of the dirt of uh, bad choices of sinfulness in our lives so you and I can bear fruit. Then it says in verse 6 that uh, those that don't bear fr uh, fruit are picked up, thrown away, and he even says burn. Now, is Jesus saying that the union with him, the relationship with him, uh, is he saying that we can lose that relationship or lose our salvation? You know, I, I just don't see that in a passage. This is not a passage about salvation. These unproductive branches, as it were, are in him. That's what he said back in verse 2. And then he also said they are like a branch, like a branch that's thrown into the fire and burn. It's not so much that the branch or the Christian is burned up, I think as the results or the works of their life is burned up. The Christian never ceases to be a branch. Never, ever. Believer never uh, ceases to, to be Christian, no matter how barren he or she becomes. I think Jesus is probably describing believers who kind of drift away in their journey with Christ and begin to live a, a little bit more disobedient, barren lives, and they are kind of dead wood, as it were. The process, the process uh, uh, is so important that we respond to the pruning and to the cutting off in order that we might be lifted up, in order that might, might, we might resume again to bear fruit, to hopefully continue to grow and to bear more fruit, and then at times even to bear much fruit in our journey. So let me sum it up in just kind of three uh, truths uh, from this final uh, gigantic uh, affirmation. Number one, when we abide in him, remain in him, grow in him, when we fail to do that, should I say, we will be less fruitful and we will be disciplined in love. So how do we grow in him? How do we abide in him? Bible study, worship, serving, prayer, fellowship with other believers. If we're consistently seeing no fruit in our lives or very little, we need to really check our relationship with the vine and whether or not we're abiding. Truth two, when we abide and respond to his pruning, 
which is painful, to his cleansing, which hurts, we will become more and even much more fruitful. Pruning is always painful and it's never pleasant. Pruning drives us closer and back to the source. We need to remember, my friend, God's hand is never closer to us than when he's pruning us. And then third, and I think so important because it's why we exist, God is glorified when we bear fruit. God is glorified when we bear fruit. That's so very, very important in our journeys that we realize that our Heavenly Father, when we bear fruit through our relationship with Christ, that He is glorified in our journey. Let me close with a little bit of an illustration. Just imagine you've got a pair of scissors in front of you. And we know that, uh, they consist of two single blades. Yet, those blades, regardless of how sharp or how shiny, are useless without one main essential element. And that's that small metal screw that holds those two single blades together. Can you imagine trying to cut paper or fabric without that tiny screw? Of course, you could put a blade in each hand, but I really think that would uh, uh, be very difficult to try to cut an even and, 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 uh, and a precise way. But when that little screw brings both blades together, suddenly doesn't the becoming, uh, cutting just become almost effortless? Here's the application. In our relationship with God, abiding in Jesus, abiding in Him is the screw that holds everything together and makes us useful to Him. What a great series. Gigantic affirmations, declarations about Christ, the seven I am sayings. Thank you so much for listening to Truth That Transforms. Remember, it only transforms us when we apply it. Blessings from Pastor Jimmy. I look forward to seeing you next time.